You're listening to episode 38 of the D6 Podcast. Here's the encouragement I give you. The shortest distance between your child's heart, your grown child's heart, and Christ is you. Parents need to own that they are the primary disciples of their child. Our goal in parenting is not for our kids ultimately to get a great education, as good as that is. Our goal is not for them to be great athletes. Our goal is not for them to go on great dates and have, find a great husband or a great wife. Our goal is not for them to have a great career with a great job, making great money. Our goal is for them to love a great God. A great God, a great God. A great You're great listening God. to the D6 Podcast. Here's your hosts, Ron Hunter and Jeremy Lee. This is the podcast that helps you build an excellent family ministry in your church. And it's the new year. We're kind of settling into the new year, Ron. And I don't know. I I like to set goals every year. Have you set goals for 2017? I have. I've got a little more free time on my hands. And so I'm trying to do a little more personal reading rather than uh, assigned reading. And uh, also just working on those general health areas that many people think about at about this time of the year. But this is a great time to be setting goals and all of those things. And maybe one of your goals as a minister is to level up in your volunteer training. It, it sometimes is the forgotten piece of our ministry programs because we have the pressure of the weekly event and the big events and all of those different things. But we all understand that none of that works unless we have a solid, good volunteer culture. That's what we're going to be talking about today, hopefully serve you a little bit with one of the, uh, in, at least in the children's ministry world, one of the experts in this area who's, who pretty much does this weekly, goes around and helps churches do this. So for free, she's coming in to help you today. Her name's Melissa McDonald. She's going to be awesome. And then we have a legend, Bruce Wilkinson, that you'll be interviewing. Correct. He, he's the one that you heard from with the three chairs recently. And he's going to be talking about that, the sin of unforgiven, uh, unforgiveness and what it does to us. And, uh, you know, when we come out of the holidays, as you've just talked about, not only do we set goals, but prior to setting goals, we have a reflection time. And the holidays brings up a lot of family memories. And while we want to think greeting cards and, and carols and, and decorations, for a lot of people, those memories are not pleasant. And so I hope that if you've had some real struggles with some memories growing up and and some guilt, some unforgiveness, or, you know, you've experienced any of those areas that you stay tuned to listen to Bruce challenge you on how to navigate that unforgiveness. That sounds good. So we are going to be real practical in the beginning and then really dive into heart matters towards the end. So I think this episode will have a nice uh, feature of a little bit of both worlds. So when we come back after the interview... We'll be hearing from Melissa McDonald on how to be awesome at volunteer training. What's it like to be a member of the D6 Leader Network? Well, what if I told you that you could hire an intern for your ministry that would plan your sermon series each month and create amazing graphics to help promote it? What if that same intern helped you train your volunteers by writing an online teacher training every month that includes a fully produced video without you even having to touch it? What if that same intern created a fully designed parent resource that they can actually use to help them spiritually lead their family? What if that same intern was able to get you access to every main stage talk, breakout, or interview D6 has ever done at their D6 conference for your own training and development? That would be the best intern in the history of the world, right? Well, becoming a member of the brand new D6 Leader Network is like hiring an intern to do all of that and more for around a dollar a day. We make your life easy. We make awesome easy. If you are a minister, you can go to d6leader.net to learn more. My guest today is Melissa Mac Donald. She travels extensively. Ex- <laughs> she travels extensively. 
uh, speaking, training, <laughs> coaching, and consulting. She's the author of Missing, an urgent call to the church to rescue kids. She currently serves as the national children's, dis- why not international? I, I do some international work, but you know, so officially it's national. Okay. I'm going to rewrite. I'm going to do a quick edit. Do it. She currently serves as the international Boom. children's disciple making specialist for the Christian and Missionary Alliance denomination. Woo. With a fresh and unique perspective, Melissa boldly calls the church to be the church, capital T, capital C, everywhere she goes. She's been to over 30 countries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And seeks out the best ethnic food in every city I she like visits. I like to eat. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. Melissa J. McDonald.com is her site. Now, we want to talk about this. I want to boil this down to really focused theme because there are ministers listening, age graded ministers, you know the deal. Yep. And they have to train volunteers. And there's three things we have to do in an age graded ministry we have to help the actual <laughs> students, we have to equip the parents, but then we have to build an awesome. Uh, volunteer team yeah. and the only way you build that is by training those volunteers so I want to dig up some awesome stuff to help the folks that have to do volunteer training to be ninjas at it so awesome. since you're a volunteer training ninja <laughs> I made an assumption that we might be able to help them is that cool that's awesome let's Love do it. it all right so let's start with this how often should I train my volunteers if I'm a minister and I want them to be awesome how often should I train them in a calendar year a really great question um I, I wish i could say oh four times or six times i think it really depends on the church i think it really depends on your ministry and i think i'm going to say that about a lot of these questions um just because, give me a heads up just give me a heads up <laughs> but the thing is you have to know your own church you have to know your own people and you if you're not if you're not casting vision every week to your volunteers then you need to do a lot more trainings if you're casting vision and you're checking in with them you can do a lot fewer trainings i would say at least doing two um and i would say don't be don't be so frustrated when they don't all come that's life so they may not all come to your training and that's that's okay but um if you can do two three four a year you're golden and make them awesome mm-hmm. Well, and uh, what about the fact that we don't have to do live training, do we? we there's with with this thing called the intranet, the, the interwebs. interweb. <laughs> there's there's other ways, right? There are other ways, and I was gonna I was gonna actually mention that there's other ways to do online training. I have one one gal I work with who does um, a training actually over Facebook. She gets them all in a group, and ah. they set up a time, and they just begin to do their training. That way, if they have kids at home and they're fixing mac and cheese or whatever, they can check back in watch something listen answer questions and so there's lots of creative ways i still think you need to at least have twice a year where you're all together as much as you can get together because part of the fun of being a volunteer is the community and so you don't get community as easily when you're doing something that's not together in person so i don't like to defraud that community time just to make it easier all the time yeah one innovative (laughs) thought potentially would be that a minister who doesn't feel like it's working well should try something new, right? So if you have only been doing it twice, maybe try four. Yeah. If, if you've been doing meetings live at the church, maybe go on a retreat. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah. What are some other variations? Well, and I think you have to look at yourself, too. It may not be going well because you're bad. You're just oh. bad at it. Oh, <laughs> Melissa. I know. That's harsh. Well, why are we doing that? Well, here's the deal. You might be bad at it, and that's not bad. <laughs> that, that is? Well, okay. <laughs> no, it just it feels, might not. I feel bad. It, it may not be your gifting. It may not be your gift. Are you, are you I'm doing t- the finger, <laughs> not the finger. Let's clarify that. <laughs> um, it may not be your gifting, and I think a lot of times our leaders don't actually look at themselves and go, you know what? I'm not very good up front, or I'm not very engaging, and that's okay. You're gifted in a different area. If you're not, that's not your greatest area. Find someone else who's going to do a really great job and put them up or change it up. I do a lot of trainings. I go into churches and do trainings, and and I'm kind of a ringer for them because I enjoy it. I'm good at it, and people will come. And then it kind of, you're able to sit back and actually take part. So I think change it up a little. It doesn't always have to be you. It doesn't always have to be a PowerPoint. It doesn't always have to be about, you know, practical toilet training options and stuff like that. So kind of making it to where it's it's a different topic. It's fun. And um, and I think you always have to cast vision. Don't just get right into, okay, everybody's been late for the last five Sundays. So, <laughs> but go, man, did you know that there's this, this Johnny who's been coming and God's been working in his heart? And because God's working in his heart, his whole family started coming to church. That's because you as volunteers show up every Sunday and you love on Johnny. Well, right there, everyone wants to continue to be in that ministry. And they want to continue to understand why they're at training. So casting vision, I think, is a great way to change it up. I love retreats. I love getting a team together.
together. I, I love doing shared experiences, even if you just go bowling together, which I hate bowling, but go, you know, go a skating, do something where you're just, you're hanging out because it is community too. And for a lot of these people, that is their community. And so providing those opportunities is really cool. And when you pick an activity, don't just pick one you love. I, know, I was on a team I... once where the leader made the whole team do the sports and the things that he was really good at. And all the other people who didn't care about that sport were like, whatever. It was so lame. And there was, it didn't accomplish his goal at all except making him look awesome. Yeah, not but, everyone wants to be on a fantasy football team with you either. But I'm not bitter or anything. <laughs> yeah, all right. good. Next, so during my training times, what are some awesome <laughs> activities I can do with my volunteers to break the ice, create a fun environment, but still introduce the topic? So the reason why I say this is because I can remember a huge season in my life as a minister where I would have these volunteer training meetings and they would sneak up on me and uh, it would be like, oh snap, I have a volunteer training meeting. I have to be terribly creative and I would go look for <laughs> something that I could grab yeah. and then I couldn't find much. So in case someone's in that scenario right now and they have a volunteer training coming, let's give them some cool icebreakers, some cool ways that they can get their team together, have a little bit of fun and introduce the training topics. Yeah, and I'm really bad at icebreakers. So this was That's an awesome why you weren't question. supposed to ask that question. <laughs> no, honestly, I'm terrible at them because I, th I just don't think like that. But I do think... What do you do to begin a training? What do I do is, first of all, I always have food. So that's your icebreaker. That's my icebreaker. Taco Tuesday. <laughs> anytime. anytime I, that, we have innovative <laughs> things here on these interviews right now. That's right. Tacos. Bring that is it. how you it buy It could be because it's the lunch hour. I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, I always have food, and I always have prizes, and I always make it fun. Like, we, we spend some time uh, talking. You know, what's something funny that's happened lately uh, in your kid's ministry? What's, what's something that you heard a kid say you can't believe they said it? You know, what's going on in your own life? I'm always about community building, so um, I've done the M&M game, you know, where you pull different colors, and I don't know, something happens, and this is not my thing, so if I I'm going to do it. I get someone else to do that because I know I'm not gifted in that area, which goes back to my last point that if you're not gifted, don't do it. Next question. <laughs> yeah. All right. So walk me through the different elements that need to be involved in a volunteer training, because I know you got this down. The meeting agenda needs to have certain elements in it. Mm -hmm. You've already talked about vision casting. How do I set up a training meeting so that it's awesome? Okay, well, first of all, your time limit is important. Um, if you are going to have an hour-long meeting, you end at 55 minutes. Because if you end early, your team will come back because they go, she she respected my time. Um, and so you end early. And whether you're done or not, you're done. Because um, I really believe we have to respect people's time. Um, and if you're not getting people to your t meeting, you probably have killed them in a meeting in the past where it went for three hours or it had no point. Um, so keep your time limit. I don't like any hour. I don't do anything longer than an hour with, um, with kids ministry training, unless I'm brought in for an all day training. Mm -hmm. But if it's just a Thursday night, we're starting at seven, we will be done at seven 55. Uh, I don't tell them that, but then they're just happy cause we're done early. Um, and then you've got to have a good topic. You've got to, and not just a good topic, but you have to have a topic. You have to, this is what we're talking. What I go to a lot of churches and they go, well, we planned six trainings this year, but we don't know what we're doing at any of them. <laughs> well, don't have, we a know we're gonna do exactly. don't have a training just to have a training don't don't have a training because it's on the calendar and you don't know why so if you can sit down and map out like this is what we're going to talk about we're going to talk about you know um, the developmental side of kids we're going to talk about how God is working in their lives we're going to talk about how to engage them how to deal with um, behavior issues that type of stuff and make it very practical and make it something that can be t and I think it's important contextualized outside of the church as well so if I'm a parent coming in this isn't just about my church volunteer time this is oh that works for me at home so they're getting more than just that out of it uh, I always give prizes away we always do a drawing and I do a drawing about every 10 minutes at least oh. and they're not lame prizes like they're fun prizes because um, it keeps their attention and especially if I'm doing like a training on like just our safe place our risk management policies oh that's so boring it's so bad and so it has to be done but then I'll throw in a prize. So right after we ha you know, have to talk about appropriate touch or inappropriate touch, it's let's have a door prize. And that breaks the ice. It makes everyone comfortable again. Um, and so you do that. You kind of start with, we're glad you're here. Let me cast the vision. Here's our topic. We're going to get into that. And then spend time with not just you talking. Let them talk to each other and let them you know, get in a couple of groups and talk about this. What are you thinking here? And then I always end with them praying together. And not just me praying, but them praying. Because if they can grab on to the ownership of the, the spiritual lives of these kids and owning what God's allowing them to do, um, 
then they'll come back to my meetings and they'll show up early for their job. Mm. And uh, so I always like to do that. Good. See, you nailed that one. <laughs> Thank you. I told Icebreaker you not to ask questions. me that last one. I told you not to. I'm sorry. Number four, how do I connect with volunteers who don't show up and don't care? Because we talked about you can only do training so many times. Yeah. But there comes a time where <laughs> they, they're not showing up. They're, they don't really have a lot of passion, but they're kind of still doing it. And both of you know there's something wrong. What do you do? Yeah. Good, 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 good stuff. Um, again, I always look at myself and go, am I... Am I not casting the vision? Are they not excited about this because I just am not helping them get there? Or is it them? Um, and and if it's them, I really try not to be afraid to have a tough conversation. And we need you here. Um, <clears throat> the other thing would be to any email I send out, even if it's just a reminder, you've got to you've got to say why we're doing this. You know, hey, you're serving a nursery this Sunday. Just a reminder, we had 19 kids last Sunday. Three of those kids were from brand new families that all have shown an interest in attending our church because their kids were so well taken care of and loved. As you serve this Sunday, understand that that's what God's going to allow happen through you. You cast a vision, you get them excited. Yeah, I want to show there. I show up. I want to be there. Um, so I always I, I want to make sure every time I communicate, I'm saying, here's why we're doing it. Here's why we're doing it. Not just because I need a babysitter, not just because I need a person, but because we have a ministry God's given us. And then uh, I also just look at they may not be in the right spot and that's not on them. That's more on me as a leader. I may have plugged them into the wrong spot, or it may have been a trial run, and we're both going, this is not working. Um, and then, you know, I'll have a tough conversation with them. The other side of it, too, is what's going on in their real life. If I, as a, I think as children's directors, pastors, leaders, we, we often forget that we're not just the pastor to those kids, we're the pastor to our volunteers as well. And we have to pastor and shepherd their heart. So I need to know what's going on with them. Like, I need to know what's going on in their life. I need to know... If they're having marriage problems, if, if their kids are giving them fits and they just can't deal with it. Because when I know that and I care more about them as a person and their interpersonal life, then I'm much, I'm much better able to, that's not a good phrase, but I'm, it's much easier for me to allow them to serve where they should be serving or give them a break if they need a break. Mm, I love that. So how do I connect with Bon? Oh, sorry. What are your recruiting secrets? This is a good one that you can share with us to get awesome volunteers from the get-go. So, because that's crucial. It is. You don't want you don't want to get bad people, but sometimes you got a hole and you got to fill it. And the temptation is to just get anybody who'll say yes. Yeah. So how do you recruit and recruit well? Uh, I recruit by making it not just about me, <laughs> and I don't sit down with a spreadsheet and just go, I'm going to start making calls. I, I get my team together, and whether I've got two people on my team, and by team it could just mean me and someone else who loves kids, or I've got eight people on my team, um, I, I divide it out and go, we, we really need this. But before I ever say, I need you to talk to this person or that, we pray about it. Because my pitfall is always forgetting that it is God's ministry, not mine. So there's sometimes this feeling like, well, if I just lay in bed really late at night and panic, that's going to help. Or at least I'll feel better. And I don't. And I also am pretty much disrespecting God saying, well, it's your ministry, but I'm going to worry about it that's just not even the right way. And so I always, and I do it so much for myself, you know what I mean? Where you're like, okay, I have to make sure my heart's in the right spot. So we pray about it and we don't do it out of desperation. We do it out of this desire to put people where they fit. And, uh, and then I get my team excited. If my team, if your team is excited about the ministry, they're going to naturally have these conversations with people like, oh my goodness, I love what we do in small group on Sundays. This is what happened this Sunday. That's the best recruitment tool out there. Um, so those conversations, when it comes to um when it comes to like I see people I was in a church where they had a clipboard for nursery volunteers and they said nobody's getting out until this clipboard is filled up because we need someone <laughs> I'm visiting I filled that thing out I was like I'm hungry and <laughs> I was visiting and you know so we, we've got to quit doing those approaches because that that we're recruiting out of a desperation out of fear out of just fill the spot nobody wants to be there because of desperation fear or they just want to fill a spot and so um, promoting like look what God's doing and you have an opportunity opportunity to be a part of this and that it is a privilege for you to be on our team because we don't put just anyone and if you have put just anyone you need to get them off because 
some of them should not be serving in kids ministry. Um, and so I do that. And then there's little things like promoting. I, I was just in a church where their kids are all downstairs and they actually check in downstairs, stay downstairs. So the congregation upstairs in the sanctuary in the worship time never sees kids. And then they go, man, we just can't get anyone to serve with our kids ministry. They don't even know there's kids down there. And so how can you get give the kids exposure? How can you bring that to the forefront? And I always suggest spending at least once a month where whether it's a quick story up front or it's a, it's it's letting the kids come into the service to do something, not to put them on parade and put them on a show, but to allow them to take part of the church community as a whole. Something intentional so people go, oh, we do have kids here. Oh, I didn't know. Um, and just be talking about it. And I've, one church brought a balloon in their sanctuary, one, ki- one for every kid. And when people saw all that they were like we had no idea there were this many kids um so you, i was like you got to create a buzz but buzz can be like not a great word sometimes especially because i work in colorado and so i don't mean that kind of buzz but you have to begin to create this excitement this wow i want to be a part of that and that's just a short i, I do a whole hour long seminar on that so that's a short i'm not going anywhere <laughs> you're not <laughs> no, that's a Jesus. short bit of it <laughs> so let's uh let's do this if because this is a very real thing. If I yeah. need to fire a volunteer, and that sounds so weird, yeah. but it, it's it's real, and it's real life, and it's part of having an awesome volunteer team. It is. Because the, it's not just bringing people on. It's it's helping people uh, move when they need to. Yeah. Uh, is it okay to fire a volunteer? And if so, how do I do it and still keep my job and not make people too mad? <laughs> well, y- y- it's okay. <laughs> and, in fact, please do it. Um I I think in churches we deal with a lot of fear and we don't like to rock the boat and I that frustrates me because I really and I say this everywhere I go Jesus didn't die on the cross so we could live in our comfort zone he didn't die on the cross so everyone can do exactly what they want to do and never be stretched Um, and what we have in a lot of our kids ministry are people who are mavericks and people who are unhealthy mavericks who are unwilling to come and be actually a part of the team Uh, people and we've all had them in our churches and I know I'm not unique here but people who go well I wrote my own curriculum and I teach second grade and I'm not doing that curriculum that that's not team that's that's not that's not helping anybody and so there there are times and I've had to fire a number of them and it's I don't like the word fire but I'd like like you know replace them sorry replace. <laughs> well you know <clears throat> making it sound more politically correct <laughs> but understanding that and it goes back to that where are they gifted where should they be serving I, I had a couple in a church in Idaho I was serving at that um I plugged into our children's church ministry I said, we try it for a month. Well, they tried it. They were terrible at it. I mean, genuinely bad. And it was awkward because I was really close with them. And it was awkward for them because they knew they were bad. You know? And so I finally, I said, you know, let's talk. How do, how do you guys feel like that went? They're like, yeah, we're, we don't think that went well. I'm like, no, you're, you're really not very good at that. <laughs> but then I did this instead of stopping there. I said, you know what you are good at? Every single parent who walked in felt welcomed by you, and every kid wanted to come in because you made them feel like they belonged here. And I said, you guys have the gift of hospitality. Like, you're amazing at that. Have you considered being a part of our hospitality team in the regular big church? Well, they did that. Now, seven years later, they're heading up that hospitality team because they found their niche. And so it was kind of a redirect. And I think when we fire someone or get rid of them, it has to be a redirect. It can't just go, hey, you're not coming under my authority, so you got to get out. It has to be a, you know, I really appreciate what you've been doing, and I've noticed this gift in you. Would you consider trying it over here? Now, that's in a perfect world. You get the people. And I had an elder and his wife leave the church because I, I, I let her go. Um, and it actually was a very good cleansing thing for the church. I mean, it really was genuinely, it was it was toxic. Um, but I tried to redirect her she wouldn't redirect but she was she was tearing my team apart she was negative with my kids the parents were frustrated and I just I had to I had to let her go and it was not a pretty letting go but I did it kind and I not everybody is not going to be mad at you but if you can do it where you redirect them you speak words of life into them instead of words of death or words of we're taking you out of your comfort zone with no other option um that is really positive, and I have seen really good things come out of that. Um, and I do wish, in my, 
you know, if, if we say anything here, it's, you know, have those hard conversations. Ministry is hard. And I think we're called by God to have those tough conversations. And it's not just about us and our ministry. We have no idea what God's doing in the life of that person. And they may need to be redirected so that God can use them more fully, so that God can go, this is what you were created for. And when that happens, and I've seen it, and that's when I, I don't think I'm a volunteer ninja because I don't know ninja stuff, but I love volunteer recruiting. It is my favorite thing to do because I love plugging people in where they fit and watching them grow. That's discipleship. And so if you look at it as discipleship, you look at it as, as um, growing people in grace and godliness, then it's really, really exciting. And we just, I directed my VBS at my home church in all my free time. Um, in August and our first night we had 90 volunteers and 97 kids which is insane but it was so neat the church came around it and people plugged in where they fit they weren't all with the kids we didn't have a one-on-one -on -one ratio but you can get people you just you have to do it well you have to do it where people go I want to be a part of that team and you as a leader have to be someone that people want to serve under mm -hmm. and if you're not you may not need to be the head person you may not need to be doing the recruiting but and you may need to have like a integrity and heart check but people do want to serve and they're looking for a place to serve and a place to belong and there's there's no better place than volunteering in ministry that's awesome as you can tell, Melissa knows what she's doing, and she you help and serve churches. I do. Uh, she's a consultant and uh, also an author and a trainer and a speaker. So you want to get involved, and if you want to connect with her online, it's Melissa J. McDonald. Mac, M-A-C. Mac, M-A-C, make sure you get that right, mm -hmm. uh, dot com. And you can visit her on Twitter. She's very active on Twitter, at Kids Consultant. Great yes. Twitter handle. I've always told you that. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here with Thanks us. Thanks for having great. me. What if you could multiply your ministry 168 times over? We have a way for you to do that today. We believe that true discipleship is attained through diligently studying God's Word and applying the scriptures to your daily life. Spending one hour each week out of 168 in a worship service is simply not enough. D6 Devotional Study Guides are here to help. Each week, everyone in your family studies the same theme with lessons and devotions appropriate to each age level. Moms and dads will love the devotions and articles as conversation starters. Children will love reading and playing games in their own devotional study guide. Families will love spending time together during the week discussing and studying the scriptures. To learn more about the D6 devotional magazines, you can go to d6family.com slash d6 curriculum. Thank you to Melissa McDonald. Like I said, she is a hired gun in this area. So she is. You guys got some free stuff there. And this is a great time, as you said earlier in the episode, to be working on tweaking and, and raising that bar. People are already new, going after new expectations. Get your volunteer training in order. Get it ready going into this new year. Then it gets better through uh, the fall, which is always your big kickoff to that new year as you have different promotions in your church. so And a little plug for Melissa. Bring her in. Bring, That's right. You know, especially if you're in children's ministry world, Google that girl and get her all information and book her because she is great at what she does. Uh, speaking of great at what they do, Bruce Wilkinson, uh, you kind of set this up in the beginning of the show, but basically what you're going to make us do is all have to go see counselors and pay for therapy because <laughs> we're about to talk about unforgiveness and being wounded, and this is going to get get your seatbelt on, everybody. That's right, and and this is good therapy for all of us, that, that woundedness, that unforgiveness. Uh, Bruce is just going to help us walk through this very carefully, very delicately. We're sitting here with Dr. Bruce Wilkinson. Uh, what a, a great leader. He's an author and a Christian leader in so many ways. And uh, Dr. Wilkinson, I can talk about you for uh, ongoing, how you've impacted so many people, but uh, you founded and were the leader of Walk Through the Bible for 25 years before you felt a calling and a direction to, uh, to move in other areas that God was leading you in. But even during that time and afterwards, you have authored some significant books, The Prayer of Jabez, The Secrets of the Vine, 
a lifeguard rewards the dream giver, the first three being New York Times bestsellers. Uh, you've continued to help unselfishly raise money for other organizations, over $300 million. And with your new organization, uh, Teach Every Nation, you continue to impact lives with practical studies and courses that truly affect every aspect of ministry life and family life. So I want to say thank you for being with us at the D6 podcast today. Thank you, Ron. It's great to be with you. And D6, believe in uh, what you've been doing all these years. Well, thank you. Thank you. I want to talk about uh, a book that you have recently uh, released called The Freedom Factor, Finding Peace by Forgiving Others and Yourself. You know, in the description of that book, and as I've, I've kind of wandered through the uh, table of contents and, and read through passages of it, you use the phrase that this may be the most pressing sin that's facing us today, unforgiveness. How has that affected families today? You know, when you have a teenager that all of a sudden won't talk to you anymore and uh, begins to uh, demonstrate behavior that just you wonder when you scratch your head, why are, why are you rebelling like this against me? 100% of the time, it, you, tr you trace that thread back through time and you'll find that you as a parent, either knowingly or unknowingly, did something that wounded your child. Mm. And because it wasn't dealt with for whatever reason, that child f went through a slide, a set of st steps, because unforgiveness uh, n never stays the same size. It grows, and it, it moves into anger, and then it moves into bitterness, and then it moves into slander, and then it moves into resentment, where the ch your child, your teenager, perhaps will just list a whole bunch of things that you don't even remember ever happened as reasons for how and why they're treating you that way. And then it moves into strong dislike and a desire for vengeance, because you hurt me, I want to hurt you. And if you realize that's what causes it, then you can go back and say to the young, uh, your, your son or daughter, you know, somewhere in, uh, in recent days, I think I hurt you. How, how did that happen? So and if you, if you don't break that and just be quiet, that young person will try to change the topic, but just be quiet and keep on uh, being receptive, and they'll explode typically and tell you what it was and if you help that young person to forgive you, if you apologize, if it's that's what's needed, or a fuller understanding, and if the person forgives you, you know, Iran, what happens? Vengeance is gone. Hmm. So bitterness so, is gone. So when when they're moving down this cycle, and, and I, I want our listeners to hear this carefully, you said anger breeds bitterness to resentment to slander to strong dislike and this desire to hurt. And I think there are some parents out there that might would identify what stage their teenagers are in. But if they're going to explode and they're going to hear all this blame going on, they've got to get them back down to that root area to have that heartfelt conversation. How does the parent de-escalate that situation? Well, you know, Part of it is the, your tone and whether or not you value your, your relationship with your teenager enough to go through the painful conversation and establishing if you uh, did something that really did wound them. Maybe you weren't even aware of it. Right. But uh, oftentimes we, we just miss something that wounds the person and the teenager says, you know, it, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. But they, it really did wound them. So it sounds Especially, like a parent has to be asking questions during this conversation rather than accusing through this. Yes, and your body language, you can't have folded arms. You need to lean forward a little bit, tilt your head to the side. You need a pastoral bedside manner. Ooh, good word. Because that, that there is a wound, yes. an actual physical, not a physical, but emotional wound in that child's heart. And just like a physical wound, if you leave it alone and don't clean out the dirt, it will spread and become infected. That's exactly what happens in the spiritual and the soul of your teenager. So you address that, you discover it, 
walk that parent through what to do once the teen admits what that wound is. And, and I realize it could vary, but, but give them the, the, the next steps for that as we kind mm-hmm. of wrap up mm-hmm. in the next two minutes here, two to three minutes. You know, a wound is painful. And because we can't see the wound in, in our child's life, we assume that it's not there. We just assume they're going through a stage. They're not really going through a stage. They have an infected emotional system. And that emotional system over time will become more infected. It never stays the same. Just like if you cut your arm and get uh, dirt in it and you don't get it cleaned out and maybe you stitch it up, it will become infected. Then there'll be a line down your arm. Then you'll start getting uh, you know, a fever, and then your other systems in your body be infected. That's precisely what happens to a young person. And therefore, you have to go back to that wound and find out, you know, how, how son, or how, sweetheart, did I, did I hurt you? What happened? Because I didn't really want to hurt you, but it sounds like I did. And you need that child to tell you, and they may have a hard time telling you. They may just clam up because they've got things, you know, kind of blocked at that point. And then you're going to have to help them by saying, you know, did, did, I, did, it, did it happen this week again? Did I do it again this week? No, no, it didn't. It happened a long time ago. Okay, what did I do? What really bothered you? And when they, def- when they identify with that, what you don't want to do is to defend yourself. Because at this point, there's a wound in their heart, and it's not on who can prove who's right or who's wrong. It's whether or not you care enough to heal the wound in their heart. To, in a sense, humble yourself even if you were right, just to help them to come to the point in which you name the specific thing you did. You know, I missed your third basketball game in a row, son, and I told you I was going to be there on the first one. I promised on the second one, and on the third one I still wasn't there. And you you knew you were counting on me as your dad to be there and to cheer you on and to see you win the game, and I didn't. And uh, I, I apologize. I was wrong. Will you choose to forgive me? Will, will you let this go out of your heart? And then you have to listen and watch their body language. And if they say it too quickly, say, you know, um, I, and I'm not asking you to, to just agree with me that I was wrong. That's not forgiven. That's agreeing I was wrong. But I really, would you open your heart to me again? Will you let me in as your dad? That's really good. So I hope the parents are listening, and, and I hope they even caught what your advice was in the midst of those steps, was not only to identify and seek forgiveness, but to go back and ask, hey, did I, did I blow it again this week? And I think that's probably an ongoing posture until we learn to correct that relationship and make sure we don't step back into that or reopen that wound again. Yes, it is. And, you know, this is the same thing. Uh, You've seen this in all of your ministry in the family, Ron. Nobody gets divorced unless there is a big root of unforgiveness over a long period of time. And there's vengeance in the heart of somebody who wants to make their spouse pay for whatever they did. That unforgiveness is the great sin that ruins relationships, that splits churches, that uh, leads a person to such great anguish inside that they're, they'll do anything to find comfort, so they'll have an affair or get on drugs or get hooked on pornography or anxiety medicine or whatever because unforgiveness will not let you have peace. Mm. That's so insightful, Dr. Wilkinson. I so appreciate that, that could almost be a whole other interview there, but I'm going to ask our, our listeners to walk that through mentally, those same topics dealing with divorce. Thank you for being with us today. This is absolutely incredible. Uh, I, I think we just need to reflect on what you've just said. I so and appreciate the, your time. You're welcome. And the book, The Freedom Factor, my goodness, it is so filled with biblical insights that tell you precisely what to do. 
So many people want to forgive, and they try, and it doesn't work. It's because they don't know of the requirements that Jesus gave, five of them. They're right in the scriptures. If you want to forgive, this is how you do it. And it it is um, more than half the people read the book end up forgiving either somebody else, or sometimes even harder than that, they end up forgiving themselves. That's right. So if our listeners are listening, go out there and check Amazon out for The Freedom Factor by Dr. Bruce Wilkinson. You can click on his name and see the many other books he's also written. Thank you again, sir, for being with us. We certainly appreciate it. Well, it's always an honor to have uh, someone like Bruce Wilkinson on our podcast. And both of you, thanks to both of you, really, uh, you were super gentle with that topic, just like you said you would be, and I appreciate that so much. And um, this, the theme of the episode, one of the things we've been talking about is goals and starting the new year. And so our prayers are, uh, we're praying for you guys that are listening to this. Thank you for listening. And we're praying for your ministry this year, that whatever it is, God, whatever dreams God has placed on your heart, uh, that you would see grow and increase in your ministry and what you're doing in your city and community. Our prayers are that it would just be multiplied many times over and you would see blessings you haven't even considered yet. That's right. And next week as we look uh, look ahead, we've got two guests that I know we talk about the D6 podcast is building the, the very best family ministry, but there are some of these episodes I, I hope you are turning around and sending to all your parents. Uh, There are some that help you as ministry leaders, there are others that help your volunteers, and there are some that just help your parents absolutely succeed. And if you're not passing them along, I think you're robbing them of of some real insight and and coaching that they could get from some of these incredible guests. And next week is just such an episode with Lydia Randall and Philip Nation. Both of them are talking about parenting areas. Uh, One talks about how to help parents become more intentional at home, which we all need to be more intentional. And then Philip Nation is going to talk about those practical biblical disciplines that we all need to be modeling, whether we're mom, dad, you know, our son or daughter, whomever, those practical biblical disciplines. And he's going to hit it both from the parenting standpoint as well as the leader standpoint. It's going to be great. We'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you for listening. Talk to you then. You've been listening to the D6 Podcast. You can learn more about D6 at d6family.com. And if you're a minister, we invite you to join the D6 Leader Network by going to d6leader.net. 